On this week's Nesson Patriots podcast, we will discuss what the Patriots got accomplished over their bye week, and we will preview their upcoming matchup against the Philadelphia Eagles. Hello and welcome to the Nesson Patriots podcast. I'm Doug Kai, joined as always by Zach Cox. Zach, how are you doing? Doing well, Doug. Happy to be back. Uh, it's a little little chilly out here in uh, in Foxborough, Massachusetts. Starting to feel like feel like winter football season, but uh, it's nice and warm in this podcast studio. So so we're all set here. Yeah, it's it's freezing outside right now. It's like 25, 30 degrees, something like that. Uh, the the winter came very early this year even though Thanksgiving is late. Uh, but the Patriots were on their bye week. Uh, they still sort of, I don't know if made ground is the right way to say it, but the fact that the Bills lost over the bye week and the fact that the Chiefs lost over the bye week certainly helps them, I would say. Yeah, the AFC kind of stinks this year. It's, yeah. it's really not as... Um, Patriots don't seem to have as many competitors for that, that number one spot as they did maybe in some previous seasons. Obviously, the Ravens are still right there, and the uh, Houston Texans aren't far behind. But, yeah, Chiefs seem to be sliding a little bit. The Bills are sliding a little bit. It's, I don't know, it's, it, the, the field is opening nicely for the Patriots, I would say. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Patriots are still the number one seed in the AFC, despite the fact that they lost the Ravens. Ravens beat the Bengals this week, but they're still a game behind at 7-2, and two, while the Patriots are 8-1. and one. Patriots have... A very difficult schedule coming up here and the fact that they lost the Ravens makes me think that they might lose one or two of these games coming up as well um, so I would say that they're they're still going to be fighting for that number one seed it certainly doesn't look like they're going to be having to play in Kansas City uh, during the playoffs since the Chiefs are already six and four but I mean coming up on the schedule you got uh, Eagles in Philadelphia Cowboys at home Texans in Houston, Chiefs at home, and then at Bengals, uh, Bills at home, and they close it out with, what is it? Uh, the Miami Dolphins. Dolphins at home. So, I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> Eagles, that's a losable game. Cowboys at home, I certainly think the Patriots are going to win, but that's a losable game. Yeah, good Texan, rushing attack there. Yeah, Texans in Houston, that's a losable game. And the Chiefs, who knows where they'll be at on December 8th. So that's a, a losable game as well. So there's really four losable games coming up here. Um, obviously, Patriots are hoping that they'll they'll get out of it four and zero and and increase their record to what would be at that point twelve and one. But I mean, there's no guarantee on that, and they absolutely could lose a few of these games, including this weekend's matchup against the Eagles in Philadelphia. Definitely. I mean, it sounds a little, I guess, pretentious for Patriots fans to to say it, but. In essence, the Patriots' season started two weeks ago when they yes. played when they played the Baltimore Ravens. The first half of their season, even though looking back now, the the Pittsburgh Steelers win looks a little bit more uh, more respectable than it did maybe three four weeks into the season. But overall, that was a parade of some of the worst teams in the NFL that the Patriots played during that first half of the season with Dolphins, Jets, Redskins, Giants. The Browns are a mess this season, so it's it was really hard to kind of get a solid gauge on where the Patriots are as a team when they're playing teams like that. I mean, obviously, you only play the teams that are on your schedule, and the Patriots were demolishing most of those teams, but now they are getting into some legitimate um, competition, which they already have with with the Ravens, which was a game that obviously, obviously they lost. We're going to learn a lot more about this Patriots team over these next four weeks and until they get to that Bengals game, which is kind of a... Uh, uh, a trip back to, to what they saw in the first half of the season. But, yeah, yeah, this next month is going to be extremely difficult for the Patriots. Yeah, I mean, I think that, obviously, uh, so we discussed the game against the Ravens last week, so if you want to go back and listen to that show, you absolutely can. Um, that was the Patriots' first real significant test. Uh, like, like you said, that win against the Steelers is definitely looking better now that they're, what, 5-4 five and four five on and the four. season? Yeah. Um, and the Patriots beat them when ben, ben Roethlisberger was still their quarterback, not Mason Rudolph. But this is really their second test, and it's – it's to prove that last week was just a blip uh, on, on their schedule and that they can kind of keep moving forward from here and, and keep beating teams the way they were in the early portion of the season. Uh, because the Eagles are 5-4. and four. They're a decent team. They're not great, but that it is at least a challenge. It's not like you're going into Washington to play the Redskins or it's not like you're going to New York to play the Jets. Um, so I'm very curious to see 
how the Patriots do look in this game because Eagles are 5-4, and four, but I don't think their record really tells the entire story of that team because their secondary was really pretty horrendous over the first half of the season, and they're getting a lot of those guys back that or a lot of their defensive backs back that weren't playing in that early portion of the season. I forgot exactly uh, who Sidney Jones missed some time. Who else missed some time? Was it uh, uh, Ronald Darby was, yeah. and Jalen Mills? I, I believe so. Yeah. So yeah, it's that's really you know, if not their three best cornerbacks, three of their best cornerbacks uh, that that they were without for a lot of the, that time in the first half of the season. So I think that secondary has really been shored up a lot, and with that. I think the team probably will play its best football over the second half of the season, and that really starts now against the Patriots. So uh, I definitely view this, despite the 5-4 and four record, as a legitimate bona fide test for the Patriots. Yeah, for sure. The Eagles have been kind of a schizophrenic team this season. Yeah. I mean, they've lost to the Falcons, they've lost to the Lions, but they've also beaten the Packers. Mm-hmm. Uh, and They held the in their last two games against the Bills and the Bears, held those teams to 27 total points. Obviously, mm-hmm. <laughs> two pretty uh, suspect offenses yes in that group, but if you look at the two weeks before, they allowed 38 and 37 to the Vikings and the Cowboys. So it's been a little bit tough to gauge what to expect from this team, but as you mentioned, they are getting healthier. They do have a solid offense, even though Alshon Jeffrey, their top receiver, isn't playing particularly well this season. He's having yeah. probably his worst season as a pro, um, and he might uh, might see a lot of Stephon Gilmore this weekend, so that probably won't improve. But I mean, with Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard, that's a pretty strong uh, tight end duo there. Uh, Jordan Howard and, and Miles Sanders are kind of finding themselves a little bit um, in the running game. Their running game was pretty poor early in the season, um, and they've that's really kind of improved over the last couple of weeks. And, and Carson Wentz hasn't been hasn't been an MVP candidate by by any means, but he's been a solid pro and he's he's been playing better in these last couple of weeks. So this this is as you mentioned, this is going to be a very legitimate test for the Patriots on the road in Philly with the whole kind of. Super Bowl rematch storyline swirling yeah. around here. It's it's going to be an exciting game, and it's going to be a tough one for the Patriots. Yeah, I'm looking into this injury situation for the Eagles. Uh, Ronald Darby missed time from, what was it, week two, three, week four until... So basically they got Ronald Darby and Jalen Mills back for those last two games that they played against the Bears and the Bills when they really did limit those offenses. So, I mean... Like you said, could be because those aren't exactly the greatest offenses, but it could also certainly help that two of their best cornerbacks are now fully healthy and back on the field and playing. So um, a few weeks ago, I was looking at this as maybe a good game to get Nikhil Harry back on the field because it wouldn't be the biggest test for him since that secondary was struggling so much. But now that they're <coughs> now that they're fully healthy there in that secondary, I don't think it will be. Um, quite as easy for them there. Uh, Another injury for the Eagles is that Jason Peters likely won't play in this game, Uh, but the Eagles are actually pretty well set up Mm -hmm. at the tackle position, even without Peters in there, because uh, obviously they've still got Lane Johnson as their right tackle, but then they've also got their first round pick, Andre Dillard, filling in at left tackle, and he seems to be improving week after week while filling in for Peters. And I think there's even been some murmurs at this point of, all right, when Peters comes back, do the Eagles put him back in there or do they keep rolling with Dillard? So the fact that Peters is out, it's probably still a little bit of a hindrance, but it's not like there's a major drop-off like there has been for the Patriots from Isaiah Wynn to Marshall Newhouse. It seems like that drop-off from from Peters to Dillard is is significantly smaller. Yeah, that, that is the sense that I'm getting as well uh, based on, on everything that I've read coming out of uh, – Philadelphia this season and overall that's still a very good offensive line it still has a lot of the pieces that the Patriots saw in the Super Bowl in in Jason Kelsey and and Lane Johnson Uh, Brandon Brooks just got a new uh, contract extension so he's obviously a very good player so yeah going to be a uh, going to be going to be a tough unit for for the Patriots to to match up against Um, interested to see how they fare in in the running game in this game because we as we mentioned a lot last week that's been a real kind of area of concern for them in recent weeks, the the Eagles don't have nearly as as potent a, a rushing attack as as a team like the uh, like the Baltimore Ravens do. It's good, but though, but it's they good. are it is it is very good. I mean, yeah. it's not as good as the the Ravens. It's not as good as the one that they'll see um, next week against Dallas. But it still ranks up in I believe last I checked they were around like seven or eight in the in the NFL. There they're a solid team. As we mentioned before, they've got two. 
Um, two running backs who are both playing well. They also have Darren Sproles still, who's like 56 <laughs> years old at this point, but still kicking around. And, and Carson Wentz, too, he's, he's not going to uh, – they're not going to dial up a ton of designed runs for him, but he's a guy that if he sees a space, he can he can beat you and, and kind of take a scramble 15, 16 yards downfield. So it's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of weapons to, to account for in this offense. Howard has had a really nice bounce-back season for them this season. He was on, what, the Bears last season. Mm-hmm. Um, he's kind of had a, a rejuvenation yeah, this season. Really good as a rookie then kind of. Fell off uh, yeah. his final few years in Chicago. Um, he's got 525 yards and six touchdowns through nine games. And then Sanders is, I wasn't really, I didn't think of Sanders in this way when he was coming out of the draft. He went to Penn State. Um, but he's sort of been their, their James White type of back. And I asked Bill Belichick about how Sanders and Howard are different today during Belichick's news conference. And he compared Sanders to Darren Sproles, which was not what I was expecting him to say. Um, I do think that Sanders is a lot more of a, a typical, like traditional type running back, whereas Sproles, much smaller, uh, utilized probably more heavily out of the backfield as a pass catcher. But, I mean, Miles Sanders only had 24 catches for 139 yards last season at Penn State, no touchdowns. This season, he's already got 22 catches for 305 yards and a touchdown. So he's really increased his role in the passing game as a rookie this season and I mean those are those are two go those are two good backs those are two backs that are playing better than the Patriots starting running back and Sony Michelle right now yeah, I, I'd absolutely. say that um so yeah that's obviously going to be a significant test as you mentioned for the Patriots run defense which has struggled in consecutive weeks now against Cleveland Browns and the Baltimore Ravens uh not nearly as big of a test in the passing game but I mean Bill Belichick also said today that The fact that Sanders is such a good pass catcher that, you know, the Eagles, it's pretty easy for them to put five good receiving good five good receivers on their on the field at the same time. That's usually gonna be the tight ends, Zach Ertz and Dallas Goddard, uh, wide receivers Alshon Jeffrey and Nelson Aguilar, and then running back Miles Sanders. Uh, Deshaun Jackson's on injured reserve now, mm-hmm. correct? Yeah, they just um, picked up uh, Jordan Matthews to, to take his spot there right. as that number three receiver. And Jordan Matthews revenge game against the Patriots. <laughs> uh, their other options at receiver are the rookie JJ Arcega Whiteside and Matt Collins, neither of whom have really done much this season but I mean quite honestly I think the Patriots secondary will probably match up pretty well against the the Eagles actual receiving threats we'll see how Zach Ertz can do uh because the Patriots that, that is one area where I could see them having some issues covering tight ends but I mean you could honestly possibly put Stefan Gilmore up against Zach Ertz and just let him try to shut him down and then have your other cornerbacks Jason McCourty Jonathan Jones and JC Jackson take on guys like Alshon Jeffrey and Nelson Aguilar yeah I mean that might not be the worst plan in the world uh Stephon Gilmore did spend some time against Travis Kelsey in that AFC championship game last year and if the Patriots view him as a more of a threat than a clearly diminished Alshon Jeffrey for yeah. whatever reason then that might be the, the smarter strategy I think potentially having Patrick Chung back in this game will help them mm-hmm. in that regard he hasn't been as great against tight ends the last year or two I would say as he was earlier in his career um but still having him back in the mix he hasn't really been he basically hasn't played a full game since about week four uh because he's missed two games he had one game where he suffered an injury and left and yep. this past game against the Ravens played 40 percent of the snaps it was tough to tell if it was injury related or game plan related we right. saw a lot more um a lot more Terrence Brooks, a lot more Jonathan Jones in a, in a safety role in that game. So if he can be back somewhat close to 100%, he was back on the practice field today, um, then I think that'll definitely help them as as they go up against a, an Eagles offense that uses two tight ends more than Bill, Bill Belichick said this morning, basically more than anybody else in the NFL right now. They are uh, number one in amount of snaps run out of uh, out of 12 personnel mm-hmm. with one running back, two tight ends. So that's really their, their bread and butter and having another safety in there who can, especially one who's as, t- as talented as Patrick Chung, will definitely help in, in that regard. Yeah, this might not be a, a big Jonathan Jones game, possibly, uh, especially since the Eagles do have two bigger receivers in Alshon Jeffrey and Nelson, Nelson Aguilar. I'm sure you all remember this, but, I mean, those big receivers were possibly one of the reasons why Malcolm Butler didn't play in Super Bowl 52, that the Patriots were kind of playing a little bit of matchups in that game. Uh, preferred starting Eric Rowe because of those those bigger receivers. Torrey Smith was the third receiver yep. in that game. 
Um, and Brent Selleck and was Brent the second Selleck tight end. Brent Selleck was the second tight end. But really, I mean, going back to Super Bowl 52, I'm sure the Patriots fans don't want to get too deep into those woods, but this is a very similar Eagles team to the one that the Patriots saw in Super Bowl 52. The biggest change, obviously, is at quarterback. Nick Foles is with the Jacksonville Jaguars now, and Carson Wentz is back as the starter there. Uh, he was injured in that 2017 season. Um, but other than that and running back, the receivers are largely the same. They've still got Zach Ertz. Most of the offensive line is the same. A lot of the same names on the defensive line, like Fletcher Cox and Brandon Graham and, and Timmy Jernigan. A lot of the same linebackers like Nigel Bradham, uh, Nathan Jerry, and Kamu Grugier-Hill. And really the same secondary uh, with Darby, Douglas, Jenkins, um, uh, Rodney McLeod, Jalen Mills. It's it's a, almost the identical team, other than that quarterback and the running backs. Yeah, really. That's the, that's what I was just going to just going to say. It's, <laughs> it's quarterback and it's running backs. They have yeah. basically a new stable of running backs in there. Um, during the the Super Bowl, it was JJ, Legarrette Blunton, and uh, Corey Clement. Corey Clement's still on the team, but um, not positive. He's on, he's, he's on IR. He's on IR. Yeah. That's what it was because I, I saw that he'd only played played four games this season. So yeah, those are really the only two. Uh, areas that have significantly changed for the Eagles since then. And going back and looking at the Patriots roster, Patriots roster has changed a lot. Yeah, it's a surprising game. amount. A surprising amount. I mean, you look at the players, especially on, on the defensive side, there are still some of the, the mainstays in there, like like Stephon Gilmore, Patrick Chung, Devin mm-hmm. McCourty, Kyle Van Noy, Jaron Harmon. But you go through these this list of guys that played on defense for them in that game. I mean, James Harrison started that game and yeah. played almost every snap. He played... 69 of 75 defensive snaps in that game. Eric Rowe played 96% of defensive snaps. You had Malcolm Brown playing a lot in that game. Marquise Flowers, Jordan Richards, Eric Lee, Ricky Jean-Francois, Johnson Batamosi. These are guys that most Patriots fans probably don't even remember were on the team for a lot of these times. And all of these guys were playing somewhat significant roles in this game. I mean, every guy that I just mentioned on that list played at least 10 defensive snaps in that game, which just shows how depleted the Patriots were defensively that year. Because as you'll remember too, that Dante Hightower did not play in that say, game yeah. because he uh, wound up on injured reserve. Jonathan Jones early that is season. On IR. Jonathan Jones is oh, one that isn't talked about much in the yeah. whole Malcolm Butler discussion, but he uh, he suffered the injury in the uh, the divisional round against the Titans. wasn't available for that game. So a lot of kind of almost wholesale changes on this Patriots defense, and even offensively, this is a pretty different Patriots yeah. offense than what the Eagles saw in this game. Because obviously you have Tom Brady, you still have a lot of the offensive line. I mean, in, or basically, not, not even a lot of the offensive line. You basically have Shaq Mason and Joe Tooney, and then David Andrews at center, who's obviously hurt now. Nate Solder and Cam Fleming were the starting tackles mm-hmm. in that game. They're both gone. Brandon Cooks, Chris Hogan, uh, Danny Amendola, Rob Gronkowski, Deion Lewis, all gone. Basically yeah. all of their offensive weapons in that game we're not uh, are either unavailable or, or currently not on the team. So yeah, very very different Patriots team than the uh, that they saw. What was this? Only a year and a half ago yeah. than the one that they have now. I would say that Patriots defense obviously has improved significantly since that 2017 season. Despite the fact that the Patriots are uh, Julian Edelman is back in this game. Julian Edelman yes. was on injured reserve in 2017. Despite the fact that Edelman's back. I do think that the offense has probably taken a step back since that year because they did have Nate Solder at left tackle, which is an improvement over Marshall Newhouse. They had David Andrews at center. Um, They had, you know, the the right tackle situation. Marcus Cannon was on IR, so that's an improvement over Fleming. And then you don't have Rob Gronkowski. You don't have Danny Amendola. Brandon Cooks didn't make it too far into that game, uh, but you don't have Brandon Cooks. But, I mean, Julian Edelman almost... He's a guy who, who does change the conversation significantly because Tom Brady trusts him so much and is targeting him so much this season that the offense has taken a step back, but the inclusion, or lack of a better word, of Julian Edelman you know, almost makes it sort of even, as crazy as that sounds. I mean, you've got Julian Edelman replacing Rob Gronkowski, Brandon Cox, Danny Amendola, but it's definitely significant to have Julian Edelman back in the offense. Yeah, I mean, that just speaks to how important Julian Edelman is for this offense. And and one more point on the Rob Gronkowski, that was Rob Gronkowski's last kind of fully dominant yes. Rob Gronkowski season with the 69 catches, 1,000 a, a yards. He had over 100 yards 
in that Super Bowl. Go, going back and looking through just the box score from this Super Bowl is pretty ridiculous, the numbers that, that people were putting up on, on both sides um, for, for both the Patriots and the Eagles. I'm, yeah. I'm, pulling, I'm pulling it up right now. And, yeah, Danny Amendola, eight catches, 152 yards. Oh, Chris God. Hogan, six catches, 128 yards. Gronk, Rob Gronkowski, nine catches on 15 targets for 116 yards and two touchdowns. I forgot about all that. Yeah. Tom Brady threw for 505 yards, three touchdowns in a, in a loss. And yeah. Yeah, even just looking at the scoring summary, it's just it basically need like three pages to print it out. It was that was one of the the wilder games that I've covered. I think. Oh, since, for sure. Since we've been here, I don't. I don't think it quite it didn't really have the, I guess the shock value of of the one the year before right. with the um, uh, the Falcons game, but it was just from pure offensive spectacle. I, I don't know if you can find any game that beats that. I was surprised at the time that the Patriots lost. I was very confident that they were going to beat Nick Foles. I was basically like, really? We're talking about Bill Belichick and Tom Brady against Nick Foles? And obviously they lost. But in retrospect, you take away, basically, other than Tom Brady and Bill Belichick, the two most important players to in this second Patriots dynasty, especially in Super Bowls, with Edelman and Dante Hightower. And it's like, Oh well, yeah, no, no wonder they lost. I mean, Julian Edelman, obviously the the Super Bowl MVP last season, um, but I mean he's been an incredible playoff performer. Dante Hightower makes massive plays that basically allow the Patriots to win these Super Bowls. So you take out that massive play that you expect from Dante Hightower, you take out the hundred receiving yards and touchdowns or whatever that you expect from from Julian Edelman, and yeah, that that's obviously that had a way more significant impact on that Patriots loss than benching Malcolm Butler did. Yeah, it did. I mean, I think people forget um, a lot of times when talking about this game that the Patriots didn't have Julian Edelman and they didn't have Dante Hightower. I feel like that's just sort of gone from the collective memory. Right. I think just because the Malcolm Butler thing is so yes. dominant in those headlines, you forget about all the little little kind of aspects that, that as you mentioned, probably even were more impactful. Yeah, so um, it will... We'll kind of see how much impact that that Super Bowl has on this week's game. Uh, Tom Brady already said this week that you know he hasn't gotten over it, and that's despite the fact that the Patriots won Super Bowl Fifty Three last season. But I, you can understand that. I was talking to uh, Matt Chatham this week on air, and and he basically said that you know that just seeing that helmet brings back those bad memories after you lose a big game to a team. So I'm sure that all those memories will come flooding back for the Patriots, especially since. Like we mentioned, a lot of those same guys are there, and they're going to be facing up against you know a lot of the same players on the offensive line and defensive line and the secondary and everything, receivers. So um, uh, Bill Belichick sort of downplayed it, but I think that the film from that Super Bowl will be important this week because it's the same coaching staff, and, and it's largely a lot of the same players. Yeah, Bill Belichick said this morning that – even though there have been some minor changes that I, I believe his exact words were the film is is worth looking at or, right. or worth watching. So you can bet that they're, they're playing highlights or low, probably lowlights from that game in the meeting rooms this week. So that is going to be, as much as the Patriots like to typically downplay these kind of quote-unquote revenge subplots, it's definitely going to be in the minds of the players this week. Uh, we could see the NFL debut of Nikhil Harry in this game. Uh, we'll sort of have to wait and see, but... It, I, I wrote this today. I know that you've been writing about Nikhil Harry as well. It is a difficult decision the Patriots would have to make to activate Harry because you're not going to dress seven wide receivers in a game. And last week, the Patriots made um, Nikhil Harry and Gunnar Olszewski inactive. Olszewski was dealing with ankle and hamstring injuries, and Mohamed Sanu filled in as a punt returner and didn't field any punts, right? Yeah, he had... Um, I mean, he didn't really have a, he didn't an opportunity. Any he didn't have an opportunity yeah. to really. Right. So who knows how it would have played out if the if the punts were True. directly to him and given an opportunity to to return. But yeah, he definitely seemed to be playing it a little bit more conservatively. So I, if if Gunner's healthy, I would probably expect to see him back there again, since the Patriots weren't willing to use Julian Edelman as their punt returner last week against the Ravens. So you know, if Gunner's healthy, I, I think he'll be in there. Jacoby Myers only played one snap last week, so. That would probably be the move if the Patriots do want to activate Harry is to make Jacoby Myers inactive. 
sort of unfair because Myers has been really solid as a rookie. Only got one snap last week when, or two weeks ago when Philip Dorsett uh, briefly suffered an injury. But, I mean, for me, Nikhil Harry was a first-round pick. Uh, I think I've probably said this before, but you can't treat him like you treated Duke Dawson last season as a second-round pick, especially with the way that the Patriots offense is playing this this year. You need to see what you have in Nikhil Harry sooner than later. And if he plays really well against the Eagles, then you've got a, a pretty significant weapon moving forward. So for me, I think that you you have to dress Harry this week. And if they don't, then you have to start being a little bit concerned with the uh, development of Nikhil Harry this season. No, I agree with that. I mean, I think people have already sort of gone gone a little bit too far with the, the Nikhil Harry panic when he hasn't played yet. With the right. fact that he wasn't active last week, people are saying, oh my God, he, he must suck. Right. There's no Why would they not play him? I think... If he doesn't get in there this week, at least to, to give him a shot, at least to have him play 10, 12 snaps and, and get him in the, in, involved a little bit, then it starts becoming a little bit worrisome. Why are they not kind of giving him this opportunity? What is he not showing that the Patriots need to see for him to, to kind of receive this opportunity? Especially because, as, as you alluded to, this Patriots offense, while they're still scoring points at, at a pretty consistent yeah. clip and they're still should be considered one of the better offenses in the National Football League. They're not winning games with offense this season. They're not a kind of explosive offensive group where there's just so many weapons in that wide receiver room that you can't find a way to to get your first round pick in there like is the case with someone like uh, Joe Juan Williams right. uh, with, in the cornerback room. You're not taking anybody out of there to put a, a rookie in and no. give him a shot. The receiving core is different. I mean, it's it's been good. I mean, Julian Edelman's obviously been great, and Mohamed Sanu has looked very good since he came in. But this isn't a, a group that's so stacked that you can't find any way to get Harry in there. I, I think if he's not active this week, then you can, you can start to, to ask some questions about that. Yeah, Patriots are second in the NFL in points per game. But, I mean... Fairly significant amount of those points came from their defense. <laughs> was it six defensive or special teams touchdowns? I think something so. Like that? Yeah. Plus, so they're in their 15th in total offense, which, I mean, that stat doesn't really matter, but it does sort of sort of show the, the high-poweredness of an offense. I think they're 11th in offensive DVOA and 13th in passing offense DVOA. So, I mean, they're, they're not... They're still an above-average offense. Their offense is not hurting them. It's not a bad offense. It's an above-average offense. But it's definitely not carrying the team like it has in years past. Uh, one other area I just want to get into real quick is the tight end position. We could see Matt Lacoste returning to the field after the bye week. Uh, he's been practicing, so perhaps you know his knee and his ankles and all that stuff is healed up. I'm not sure how significant of a boost he could have, but he might take that starting role back from Ben Watson. Ben Watson played every snap. I think the Patriots want Matt Lacoste to be that starting tight end. He just hasn't given them the opportunity to do that since he's been injured. And the tight end conversation has been a hot topic because Rob Gronkowski can come out of retirement uh, as late as week 13, November 30th. Seems like that's probably not going to happen, but the conversation was started up again. And then Jacob Hollister has actually been doing really well for the Seahawks. Patriots traded Hollister to the Seahawks for a seventh round pick over the off season. I don't look at this as a big deal because Jacob Hollister is like six foot two, 230 pounds. And if you're gonna put someone on the field like that, you're probably gonna to prefer to put Nikhil Harry on the field over Jacob Hollister. But people do see that tight end position name and think, well, the Patriots certainly could use him. I don't think they would be though, because he's not a blocker. Uh, he'd essentially be used as a third receiver. I guess you could argue would you rather be playing Hollister over Philip Dorsett or Nikhil Harry? But ultimately, in that role that he would be playing, I don't think the Patriots are in especially bad shape where you start to think, wow, we really need Jacob Hollister. At the same time, he's been doing well for the Seahawks. Even more so, I think that I've seen a, a couple people. I haven't seen – it hasn't been like kind of a widespread – um, a widespread thing, but I've seen a couple people say like, "Oh man, like how could we let like, Jacob Hollister go?" <laughs> it's like, remember when the Patriots traded Jacob Hollister? Was anybody saying right. like, "Wow, what are you doing, man? This guy's a, a young piece for us. <laughs> He's going to be a big, uh, a big, right. uh, important player in the future." No, like Jacob Hollister was a guy that showed some flashes as a rookie. Actually, looked very good in his second uh, OTAs in training camp. Then just couldn't stay healthy, and and when he was healthy. 
he just didn't make that much of an impact and, and the Patriots just I know they wanted to work with him and, and they viewed him as a as a good player at the time they they just kind of ran out of time with him and, and they wanted to move on and I yeah. think everybody understood that in the moment they're like yeah yeah Jake right. Pollster well cool like gave that a shot as an undrafted guy but yeah it didn't really work out now he's kind of flourishing in in Seattle but yeah I, I don't think that it it, it's hard to blame the Patriots and fault the Patriots for for not kind of getting this out of out of Jacob Hollister. I mean, yeah. maybe I mean if he was still here, maybe he would be a better option than Ryan Izzo or, or somebody maybe, like that. Yeah. But yeah, no, I I think anybody who's who's freaking out over this, it's just it, it's bad luck or I mean bad fortune for for the Patriots to let a guy go and then see him right. play well elsewhere. But it's not the first time that's happened. Yeah, and I mean he just he really wouldn't be used like a Ryan Izzo. He he's not a end of line player. He's He's a guy who gets split out. He's, he's also type. he's also been productive for like two weeks. Right. So I mean, he started the season on the on the Seahawks practice squad. Yeah. So it's not like they they gave away this huge chip who was competing right away. He began the season on the practice squad. It was only signed before week four or five. Uh, before we get out of here, let's play America's favorite game real quick. Uh, one before that. Yeah. Have you seen this video of of Jamie Collins doing a doing a <laughs> yes. backflip? off of a practice dummy or off of like a blocking sled yeah this is the craziest thing i've ever seen if you guys haven't seen this <laughs> look, look up it's on it's on ruthie polinski's uh twitter account it is jamie collins i mean we know he's a, an athletic freak we've seen him do all the the back like the back hands handsprings ha- and backflips. isn't there a video of him walking on his hands at practice too? there there is he's done he's done a lot of this stuff in the past but this yeah. is the craziest one i've seen he literally just puts one foot on a blocking sled and just flips off of it yeah that's some that's some kung fu stuff. That's yeah, crazy. That check, is... check that out if you haven't seen it. Um, so let's. Do you know where cornerback Craig James went to college? Craig James. <laughs> not not, the, not SMU. Not the running back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> might be SMU. I'm gonna say uh, Iowa State. I'm gonna go with Texas. Where did Craig James go? Southern, Southern Illinois. Illinois. Yeah, that's unfair. That's unfair. All right. So what, let's see. Um, do you do you remember where Camus Grugier Hill went? Oh, he went to Eastern Illinois, he right? He did. Jimmy Garoppolo. Jimmy Garoppolo and, territory. Yep. He was yeah. uh, a very short-lived Patriot who's actually had a pretty nice career for the uh, for the Eagles over the last couple of years as a special teams guy, and I think he's he's kind of carved out more of a role on defense. So yeah, good for him yeah. for sure. Um, one more in here. Do you know where? Um, do you know where Albert Huggins went? I was actually just going to ask, is it Clemson? Ooh, it might be Clemson. It is Clemson. Yeah. Good right. job. Wow. I don't, I don't, I don't know, know why one. I know that, but... I don't know if there's one on here that I do know that you wouldn't know. I feel like I'm getting worse at knowing <laughs> where guys went to school. Um, do you know where Andre Dillard went? He went to Washington State. He did go to Washington State. Um. All right. I feel like I know where Duke Riley and Alex Singleton went, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. Oh, oh well. Patriots legend A.J. Howard is on the uh, yeah, Eagles practice go? squad. Is, was he a Minnesota guy? He or might have was been. That? No. I, I mixed. There were three or four No, I think he was guys. an App State guy. App State. Oh, I think that's right. App State. Uh, and uh, projected Patriots legend Kyle Oletta is also on the uh, Eagles practice yep. squad. He went to Richmond. All right, well, that will do it. Uh, keep it on Nesson.com for all of your Patriots coverage. Follow me on Twitter at Doug Kide. Follow Zach on Twitter at Zach Cox Nesson. Keep it on Nesson.com for all of your Patriots coverage. And watch Nesson at night because I'm usually on there with Matt Chatham.